Greek principles to calculate their strategies and you know calculate and evaluate their opponent strategies so they're in a winning position so that they make decisions that you know can be leveraged for their benefit so the thing with um, game traditional game theory is that it assumes that human beings are rational but uh, are human beings rational no right we're emotional beings which gave way to behavioral game theory which basically all the research around behavioral game theory uh, centers around uh, or is based on the assumption that human beings are irrational beings and they make decisions based on BPC, right? Be beliefs, preferences, and constraints. So it's like an additional thing that's evolved over time. So we're going to be talking about three uh, different types of games here. There are many, many different types of games we play, right? All these emotional decisions which Mario missed. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to update him later about. Um, is cooperative equilibrium, uh, ultimatum bargaining, and how both of these, we're going to tie both, the, both of these games into the de design advocacy game, which is an interesting example, and Jeff will take you through that. Uh, so clicker is a bit buggy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you could stand there just in case. Um, first game is the prisoner's dilemma, right? So assume that you and your friend, you want to rob a bank because for whatever reasons, like for uh, you're tired of being a corporate slave and you want to go to Bali for the rest of your life and never come back, like for whatever reasons. You rob a bank, you're successful, you're making a run for it, but today's not your lucky day because you get caught by the cops. So now you find you and your friend in two separate rooms being interrogated by the cops. Now, they have a fair idea that you're in it together, but they have no way to, like, they don't have enough evidence. So what do they do? They give you four options. Option number one, you can either remain silent and get a year of jail, which is great, right? But they also give you option number two, which is if you remain silent and your friend confesses, what happens is you get... 10 years, you get 10 years of uh, jail and your friend goes scot free, which you don't want. And you would want to remain silent because that gives you the least amount of jail time, but you don't know how your friend is going to, you know, uh, act in panic. He might give you up, right? So the best case for you would be to confess, right? And so even if you look at this matrix, this game matrix, the best case scenario for the cops is also for you to confess, for both of you to confess, which is why they give you the exact same strategies to choose from, right? So the best case, case option for the cops and for you is to confess, right? So that's your Nash equilibrium. Which brings us to our first um, heuristic, which is pure strategy. So you have a game right now, in this, the last game you had two strategies, but if you have n number of strategies, but you, you've decided that this one pure strategy is your best strategy because it's going to give you success, the best uh, chance for success. success. If I take uh, Prisoner's Dilemma as an example, um, you, you are getting jail time, but not 10, but one, right? It's the optimized, optimized success. That's pure strategy. Nash equilibrium, again, there's no uh, reason for me to deviate from my uh, strategy because it's the best case scenario for me, right? So that's Nash equilibrium. Like, even if you've considered your opponent's choices, you know this is your best case or best chance for success. Now, what if you've, if you've had, like, consider a game where you've, you have more than two strategies, like three strategies. Who's played rock, paper, scissors here in this? Like, everyone, amazing, right? So when you play this game, what happens in your head is, first you're, like, randomly picking choices. Like, yeah, rock, 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 paper, rock, whatever. And your opponent immediately starts optimizing and checking for strategy. Oh, rock, rock, rock. So I'm going to do like paper, 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 right? So what we're doing here is like we're building a reputation with our strategies. That's great, right? So we have the power to build a reputation with our strategies. That's what happens. This is an example of a zero-sum uh, game. My gain is Jeff's loss. That kind of explains the numbers here. 
and it's a mixed strategy game. You can keep mixing it up depending on the chance, amount of times you get to play it. So basically, mixed strategies can be used in games where there are multiple rounds of play, one. The second thing to remember is that you have the opportunity to build a reputation, which brings us to our second game, um, reputation building. <laughs> Yeah, so the second game, we're going to be talking about, okay, UMO loves you guys and want Jeff and me to give you a bunch of money, um, but the, there are conditions, right? So we get to keep a part of the money if we give a part of that to you guys. So suppose if it's a one lakh pot, we're giving you 20%, right? So if you accept it, you get to keep 20, we get to keep the rest. If you reject it, None of us gets anything. So how many of you here would accept that offer? OK, all right. So that's interesting. A lot of people would, a few people would, Jeff, four of our audience here would accept it. The rest would reject it. <laughs> uh, so think about, let's like dig deeper, right? Can you go back a bit? Yeah. Not important, I covered it in the... Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so let's go a bit, uh, dig deeper into like who are the players here, right? Now, we're offering the money because we're getting something out of it, right? The people who rejected it, rejected it because they thought they were being treated unfairly. Now, Jeff's a greedy person, he wants me out of the equation and he wants to keep the money. So if Jeff the American is offering you the money, would you take it? I don't like greedy people, I'm taking them out of the equation. Me, the Indian, is offering you the money, would you take the money? Like, you see your, what's happening in your head now, right? What if it's a page three personality, like an, uh, like an uh, whatever, like a movie star or a rich person, would you take the money from them? What if it's a governing body? Like, yeah, relief fund, th th you know, 20% uh, out of the relief fund is gonna go to this flood, to the flood victims. Would you th think that that's enough, that's a good enough compensation? What if, you know, everything that you loved and treasured in your life, like your people and everything, got lost in that? Would you think 20 is enough? No, you'd want more money, right? You'd think like 40, 50, maybe 70 would be, yeah, okay, I can, I think it's okay, 70 is fair. What if Jeff and I are in deep trouble and you can see it and then we're offering you this one, you know, lack pot, I mean 20%, whatever you immediately feel like you're in a position of power to negotiate. So you see, depending on the opponents and depending on the situation, you're constantly optimizing and changing your strategy. There's a lot of interesting things to say about this, catch us after the talk for that. But what we really want to say with these uh, scenarios and games is that, you see, sometimes we're, we see ourselves, you know, being generous. Sometimes we hold back. So the thing with behavioral game theory studies or research is that they've discovered that people, when the rules are set and the game is set and the strategy is set and everything is clear to us, human beings predictably behave in a certain manner. But when it's not set, they show, demonstrate traits like altruism, cooperation, negative reciprocity, right? And of course, all of these games give you the you know, leverage to build a reputation. All right, so good. Uh, how many of you remember or ever seen the movie Age of Ultron? And you looked at Tony Stark, and you know he's a playboy, he's Iron Man, everyone liked him, and he started to build an ego. And that ego caused him to create Ultron at the you know, disadvice of all his friends and colleagues. And so he was, you know, and he kind of went ahead with that, and one of the famous parts was his argument with Mark Ruffalo. So for the point of this, uh, designers, everyone in the room, you guys are Tony Stark, and I'm going to be Mark Ruffalo or David Banner. So, you know, we as professionals, you guys should turn up at the conference. That's great. There's a lot of good talks, workshops. And you understand through your education and experimentation that we always focus on human-centered design, right, and human <coughs> and design thinking, doing the right kind of research, and applying all these environmental and psychological dimensions. 
The thing is, though, is that we build these designs, we take them to our colleagues, we take them into a boardroom, we take them to customers, clients, and a lot of times, it's not well received. So how many people have ever had a time where you put a lot of heart and soul in the design and it was rejected for some reason? Yeah, pretty much everyone in the room. So that's why the subject of this talk was to talk about ways that you as designers can use game theory strategies to help mitigate that. So often the problem is we end up like this, right? And so after our pitch, our failed pitch. Uh, so the problem is, is that you know, we're, because we're just designers, we went to school for design, but we never went to school to do human and human interaction. Like, we never went to school to be able to sell. Now, maybe some of you, you know, have, but how many of you ever, like, gotten either a street education or formal education in hustling and sales? Yeah. And so the problem is, because you're always talking about design, because that's what you know best, you become an easy target to ignore to non-designers, because you're repetitive. And the reason you're an easy target is because of a couple things. One, you may or may not have a reputation, and two, you know, it just could be circumstances out of your control. So, and the other thing, the problem with this is, is that you'll always be explaining the design because that's what we do, right? That's our discipline. So what we're going to look at is like, we're going to look at other people's motivations. And so the other people being, you know, the people you work with. So how many of you do research or consider the customer and the user every time you do a design? Yeah, everyone. How many of you ever think about, man, What's a dev going to have to do to implement this? Is he going to have to t work a 12-hour day, a 16-hour day? Is he going to lose his, you never see his family again? They'll be like, oh, oh, where'd he go? He disappeared. So the point is, is that these are the things that we're trying to get out of this for you today, is to think about how you can look at other people's motivations. Because a lot of times, we question are the rational. Because a lot of people in different organizations, they may not act in the company's best interest, right? They're acting in their own best interest. And, you know, it's human nature. We're, we're all like that. Um, as much as we try to be altruistic, sometimes, you know, we, we go the route that best benefits us. So the point to that that I want you to take away from this part is that no one, even though we're designers and we're good with customers and users, we're not arbiters of logic. No one is to other people's behaviors and emotions and the way they see the world. So what we, so what, what we did to kind of formulate this talk is over the last year or so, we've been researching two things. Uh, I went around to my company and a bunch of other organizations and asked developers and PMs and QA what they felt about designers. And those answers were pretty astonishing. It wasn't a pretty picture. Um, the other thing we did is we started observing, you know, interactions of people in rooms. So we, even in our own company, like when, we, when someone in my team would pitch a design, we would view the reactions of everyone in the room towards that. You know, whether it was physical tells or personal tells and things like that. And so. I, I'm happy to talk more about the actual research points, but you know, the, what we did here, though, is this is a, like a five-by-five five game that was similar to the games that Lubna talked about. And the top level, assuming this is you know, a non-designer entity in your organization, these are five common themes we heard from people in observation or this telling us. And then we'll look at the five or six strategies we as designers can use to overcome those. So the first thing was you're easy to ignore, and that's tough if you're always just talking about design. Um, the second thing is, uh, how many people have seen this one? Oh, your design was great, but we don't have the time and money to do this. Yeah, how many think that's kind of BS? <laughs> it's like, why did you hire me in the first place, right, if you're not going to make my design? And the reason for some of this has to do with this one. This is the most important one I want everyone to take out of here, is that non-designers don't care about you. They don't care about you at all. You don't change their lives at all. You know, they want their bonus, their salary, their social and professional standing. So think of a PM. PM might be a nice person, but what do they care about? They care about completing a sprint or some kind of other marker. And whether your design was good or not doesn't change that outcome, right? Or a developer. A developer may or may not care as well. And so and this one's also pretty bad as well. And how many of you have ever worked at a place where somebody had said this? Well, we don't care. It's a business to business application or it's an airline. They have to use our product. We don't really need design. It's not going to change an outcome, right? Because I imagine everyone here, if you're not from Hyderabad, flew here. Unless you're close, I suppose. But anyone like <laughs> didn't fly and drove like four or ten hours? You're awesome. Road trips? <laughs> sure. And so this one is the other one that kicks us, right? So how many people have ever heard this one? Oh, you know, this design's, yeah. So this is my problem. I work with a couple great people I really like personally. But they always are constantly trying to design and now design me. They're, they're devs to make it easier. <laughs> so here's some things we can do. So how many of you ever tell your colleagues, you know best because you're the UX specialist? 
Good. I'm glad nobody raised their hand. Oh, all right. That's good. You go. I like that, Tony Stark. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so then this one. What about exploring with questions? And so the idea here is that these are the, your strategies that you can use, and I'll explain the numbers briefly. Just assume zeros, no, never got no chance, and snowball in the desert to work. And then obviously a higher the number means a more profitable chance. And you know we can talk about the numbers a little bit more too. But you want to build your reputation. You want people to get to know you because what you know if people know you as a person and they know you more professionally, you're a lot harder to ignore, right? You start to get credibility. And so one of the best ways to start out doing that is explore que with questions. And these can be anything from social, like how was your day? And you know, Nick talked about yesterday in his keynote about making connections. And so that's what we're trying to say here is use questions both professionally and socially to start to get to know people and start to know what problems they face. Because then when you do your design, you can explain the benefits of the design to them. Not what the customer is going to get out of it or the user is going to get out of it, but maybe it's something like, hey, here's something that can help you solve your problem. Or, hey, I know your boss is giving you a hard time because you're, you haven't solved this developer bugs or something. Maybe I can make a design that causes those bugs to go away. So things like this. You explain why your designs are important to the individual. So you can get buy-in, right? And with that, the way to do that is to use their language. You know, we as designers, we have lingos. We have acronyms. Everyone has acronyms. Seems like acronyms are free. Uh, but the more you talk to them in their language and the way they understand that language, you can start to communicate better. You know, and one of the quick examples is if, like me, really love Marvel comics, and you can make that connection, even if you hate comic books, which I wouldn't imagine anyone would, and you know, hopefully no one does, but you can kind of start to relate to people, right? And the reason for this is you want to build a social reputation first so that people are comfortable with you and so they trust you. Because in that way, when you start to do your professional like design pitches, you're not an unknown quantity and managers and devs and QA and everyone else in the organization, finance, whoever, marketing, will take a risk on you. And it'll be far easier for you to do those you know, things. And so when you do that, though, you can find champions and you can find a way to build a coalition. And so for me, I have two people I work with, Ovi and Pallavi, who are web developers. And they believe in the designs, and we have a great reputation together, and you know, we're pretty social. And the idea is that with that, they can help me convince a dev manager. So the idea is that once you do this, you can really much remove this problem. Because if you have people, you know, instead of it's just Jeff or Lubna explaining design, and you get Ovi or Pallavi or Joe Bob, whatever, to explain design, you become much more credible. Because now if you have devs explain your design to other devs or QA, you have a higher chance of implementing your vision into products. And then that'll help the customers and the users, right? So with that, um, let's just simplify the table a little bit and say we're going to tell you, don't ever tell them you know best. That never works. Um, and so when you look at these strategies and you think about the way things you do to try to sell your designs to an organization, just always have that in the back of your head that their irrational motivation is going to be this. And this never aligns with a company's best interest or an org's. It's personal, right? Because at the end of the day, you're only working because you're taking a vacation from poverty, right? You don't want, you, you don't care where you work. I mean, maybe you really like the organization you work for, and that's great. But most of us, if a better, more interesting project came along, better salary, we're not going to be loyal to our organization, right? And again, that's just human nature. So with that, um, what I want you to take away is that don't say it in OL, don't be a Tony Stark, you know, because all you're going to do is turn people off. You know, if you just evangelize, and evangelize is a very bad word. And if you're just going to tell everyone that you know best, that the customer comes first, yeah, people know that, but they don't really care, you know, in your organization. And so try to work of being more human and more, and we say human by design, right? And try to do that kind of stuff and just think about human-human -human interaction because you'll have a much better chance in selling your designs and advocating what you want to get out of the world and what you want to put into the world. And, you know, and you'll have a stronger time combating dark patterns and ethics and all the things we talk about and people talk about in conferences or you know, maybe in just cafes to make it a better place for designers. So with that, uh, here's some books that uh, we think are really good about strategy and how to interact with people, especially irrational people, self-motivated people. Um, there's a whole lot more. Most of these have to do with game theory. You know, and the reason we start out with these other two games, The Prisoner's Dilemma and Reputation Building, was because Prisoner's Dilemma is a real life scenario that can be applied across many different ways. It's not just getting stuffed up by the cops because you robbed a bank. The head off to Bali, was it? Bali sounds good. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, Reputation Building, 
you know, as you start, there's experiments and studies around that that you, you know, can do to see what the optimal, what you have to get to give and compromise. So thank you for that. And any questions? Oh, and anything else, if you don't get a question answered here, you go to that Slack channel and uh, ask a question there and we'll answer it. Thank you. I usually feel that, you know, sometimes certain new concepts or whatever, right? It takes some time when you go back home and reflect on it and think about it. Your questions come maybe after a week, a month, or a year, whatever, right? So at any point of time, if you have any questions about this, please feel free to reach out to us, Slack channel, LinkedIn, and let's keep talking about this. Yeah. Thank you so much. No immediate questions from the audience? Go ahead, please. It's a very good question. Sneak one in yeah. <laughs> so that's funny. Yeah, sneak one in under the th no, because that would be manipulation, right? <laughs> uh, but I like your idea. You know, the point of this is to get this everyone to think about this in your organization because these strategies aren't evil. They're just ways to build human-to-human -human interaction and connections with your colleagues. You know, and if you all go out for beers or tea after work, fine. But you know, a lot of times, right? We want to just work on ways that get convince people of our design. And so it's social. If you, let, you fancy somebody and you want to ask them out on a date, you try to be funny, you try to be charming, and you, know, you try to do all these things. And there was a really interesting TED Talk, and I'll just finish real quick, called The Art of Seduction by, uh, now I forgot his name. But it, it wasn't seduction about erotic seduction. It was more like how to seduce each other in a sort of semi-social professional way as people, and just understand each other and talk to people. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that's an interesting question, right? Because you have to be the one who decides what you want to communicate to people and the takeaway is that try and work on your empathy try and understand everybody's you know issues or you know constraints right bpc what are their beliefs what are their preferences what are their constraints because when you help them it's mirror neurons you help them the person likes you that person helps you back more often than not because it's really difficult to abstract human behavior is extremely difficult. The only, you know that machines are, you know, taking most of your jobs. The only way we can get an upper hand over that situation is, you know, that human side of things, right? Machines cannot be human. So be human like you've never been human in your life before because that is what is going to, you know, help bring connectedness in a remote world. In another five, 10 years, your work situations are gonna change, right? You can see that the resources are being drained and you're not going to be having probably conferences in five-star hotels, who knows, right? So we have to build on that connectedness and again, think about it, right? In another five, six years, you're gonna be working with uh, people who've, millennials or you know, post-millennials or whatever, right? So they're not gonna be, they're gonna grow up in a world where they're not seeing the connectedness that we have seen. Just like how our parents haven't grown up in a world where they've seen technology like we have seen. So try to project into the future and inform your decisions and your strategies currently, right? Because that is a responsibility, uh, you know, as a human, which is what is wonderful about human-centered design because, you know, there's really no replacement. That's, that's all what, what, what's, what we're saying. So to answer your question, Build your relationship with people and build your instincts and, you know, learn how to evaluate it and learn how to critique it, you know. And I think a lot of speakers that I've met and a lot of workshops, which I unfortunately, unfortunately didn't get the opportunity to go and attend, I think more or less is saying the same things, you know. Don't, it's good to be confident, but really question, like go back a few steps, take a few moments to reflect. So these are, these are the main takeaways, right? Jeff, if you would like to add something to that, yeah. It is, and I'll keep brief so Lubna can add our thoughts too, is you have to make sure that when you do this, you're not, you need to show what's the benefit to them, you know, and, and if they're a non-designer, and that's what we're really talking about, what's the benefit to a non-designer about anything? It's whatever they're interested in. So yes, if you could share with design, as I said, you know, like a, you know, a QA, bugs, reduces bugs, or maybe reduces the work time. Like if you can compromise the design, it still beats, you know, it allows the user to do what they need to do. 
and it saves the devs maybe 20 work hours during the week so they can go off and do whatever else. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the idea to this is that we're, we're trying, to, trying to not talk about design all the time. We're trying to talk about other people all the time. And, you know, it helps with the ego, right? If you talk, yeah. Yeah, and there's a bit about a bit of compromise also that you do when you do some when you're in a situation that, as a designer, you're you're you want A B C D, you know everything to be implemented. But then you have this conversation. I have this. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna like. Let me bring like a personal experience to this whole you know a response. Uh, so there was this one time that I wanted this design. I spent a lot of time like researching and working with the SMEs, the SMEs were not available, so I had to do all the, you know, digging in. So what happens is when we invest all that time in making this amazingly beautiful design, you want everything implemented, right? You don't want to, and you don't mind staying back that extra hour to make sure that I want this, just get this done, please, somehow, right? But what happened is that there was this one dev, and he was amazing at his work. Like, he can code things like that. But he'd always like, you know, stop. He's practical about his time. He's, he, he cares about, he doesn't want to spend more than nine hours or 10 hours in, in office. So he's like, yes, that's a great idea, Lubna, but I do not want to stay in office for more than da da da. But as I started to build relationships, like, you know, uh, get to know the person a bit. So, you know, you obviously feel a little bit of a, you know, uh, defense. Like, you feel like, why wouldn't this person understand what I want? And how can I make him uh, convince him? Forget about that. So when I started getting to know about this person and his aspirations, I started understanding that, oh, he wants to get from point A to B. So then I could present the exact same thing in a way that, hey, you know what? You want to go from A to B. Maybe this is your chance for getting that done. And that is a genuine want. I think I would genuinely want this person to reach from A to B, right? So automatically, when that started happening, we started working, like, again, when, I, when he did that once for me, the next time I did a design, I would think, oh, I do not want to put this person in this position because I know he doesn't like to stay in office. So what I do is before I design, I have a conversation with him, and, hey, I want to do A, B, C, D, D. So then he'd you know, probably respond with, let's not do this and this because of so and so. So you take a step back and compromise and that. So it's just like a lot of things here, right? It's, a, it's, it's another strategy. So don't be unidirectional in your approach. Be multidirectional, like use different strategies and build that instinct, like what is the room feeling right now? How do I help this person? And it always comes back. This is what I've seen. It always comes back with great rewards. Even if you get out of that office and you're working in different corporates, you're, you're in your own startup or whatever, whatever situation it is that you're in the future, you always have that connection which Again, tying back to the keynote, these connections matter a lot. Not because we're making a connection with, because we want something out of it, it's because it's beautiful, right? It, the payoff is something that you can't, I don't, I don't think you can quantify it or you can you know, put a number to it. It's invaluable. Connections are invaluable. So we need to learn to really see the value of building those connections.